Welcome, welcome, everybody, Reflection Church, Reflection family. If you don't know me, my name is Benjamin. I'm the lead pastor here, and I have the honor and privilege of welcoming a dear friend of ours who is going to be sharing the word with us. How many of you have been enjoying so far 10 Rules for Living? We have been in a series, 10 Rules for Living. We're going through the 10 Commandments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There you go, there you go, that's it. And so we had a chance to go through the first two, which means now we are on commandment number three. And so if you have read in your Bibles or you read ahead, you get a chance to know exactly where we're going to be every single week. So that means next week we're going to go through commandment number four. Uh, But before we do, I'd like to welcome up my dear friend, Wayne Headley. Some know him as Bruce Wayne. So I just got to brag on, on him and his wife, Lynn. They have driven down here from Canada. Come on, across the border. They got through legally. <laughs> uh, they didn't have any problems at the border. But, but really, they were a part of this whole thing before we even started. One of the first things we did actually came from this man's mind right here. This guy is a creative of creatives. He has all kinds of ideas the Lord gives him. And so we had this great, crazy idea that we're going to start inviting people over to our house to have dinner every single Friday night. And there was all kinds of traffic. People were coming from all different parts of the city. But you know what? People started showing up and we just had a great time. It was inspired by Shabbat, which is actually Sabbath, right? And so that's something that's a Jewish culture and practice. We're going to be talking about the Sabbath next week. Um, And so it was inspired by that. We turned our phones off. We brought food together. We just had time to fellowship, and it was just a beautiful space that got created. And so that was at the heart of this church that we now have that we call Reflection Church. So this really started a lot. They were instrumental. I can't even say it. They were here at the beginning of the year, and we just gave them a great send-off. If you guys remember that, uh, they had a chance to just pour into us one last time before they left. But now they're back in the flesh. And so I said, Wayne, would you mind just blessing us? with a word here today, and I told him the specific commandment, and he, he just ate it up. He said, oh, that's the one. That's the one for me. I can't wait to talk about that one. Let's talk about the Lord's name. Come on, let's go. So, uh, so I'm glad to have him here, and I would love if you guys would just give one more warm welcome for Wayne Headley as he gets ready to share the word with us. Wayne, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. you guys, stay close. Stay close. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I like that. That's the thing about reflection. It's just, it's got another level. You guys keep going to, ne- to the next level, and I love it. You know, uh, I love the idea of church not as usual or church not normal. Uh, that's out of Benjamin's heart. And uh, I think that that came directly from the heart of God to do his heart, and he's communicated that over and over. So... I don't know what you expect. You may, though, after today, realize how gifted this man is as a speaker. Uh, And I say that, and and I'm not joking. You know, so I've been a pastor for, wow, I'm dating myself now, but over 30 years. And this is not my gifting. This is not an area that I find easy. When you talk about delivering the word of God to a community, I've never felt like from the beginning, oh, I got this. This is what I do. I believe this man has a gift to do that. I really do. I've watched him translate the word of God into a language, a communication style that we can receive easily. Amen? Am I, do some of you agree with me? Yeah. If he was doing it just by his own ability, it it wouldn't have, it wouldn't, it just wouldn't resonate. But there's anointing and a grace on his life to share the word of God. And so we receive that gift and that anointing. And so I, I don't take it lightly that he has asked me to stand in here today because I don't want to diminish the gift that this man has. So I wanted to acknowledge that right off the top. You also have some other preachers in your midst. Yancey? Uh Uh-huh. Let's talk. (laughs) We're going to pray on that one. (laughs) 
don't, don't pray too long. <laughs> you know, just to hear someone share from their heart, this is how I was, and this is how I am. And I'm back there saying, and I can see how you will be if you continue on this course. Because God's got a purpose and plan for your life. It's not a plan to harm you. It doesn't matter how strong you are. You can, you, you can stand in a place like that in your natural strength. And you can mess some people up. But let me tell you, when you get the gospel in you, when you get the word of God in you, then you can really mess people up. And that's what he's calling you to. He's going to put something in you, a power and a force that you can't even imagine. In places you will use it that when people would have generally leaned on their flesh, you will say, no, I'm leaning on the word of God. And you will find that he is the rock. You know, the rock, you can fall on it or it can fall on you. You decide. But when you fall on the rock, you will find yourself rooted and grounded in ways that you never could have imagined. And yes, see, I can tell the word of God is in you and it's going deeper in you. And there will be a day coming when you will only want to speak the word of God because it is not only the truth, but it is the power to save it is the power to discern between spirit and marrow and truth and life and light and darkness. And you have that power. God just says, tap into me. You know, I just love hearing it. Tim, my host, our host, my wife and I, my beautiful wife, Lynn. Give it up for Lynn. <laughs> we will, as the 27th of this month, it will be 39 years. 39 years. Amen. Yeah, and this, this last year has been a trip. <laughs> it has been a trip. So, boy, Tim and Ophelia hosting us. Thank you so much, Tim. And the word of God, when you come into a place of refuge, we were on the road yesterday. So we've been on the road for, well, well over 20 hours, I guess, in the last couple of days. It seems like somewhere there, give or take. So to arrive at Tim and Ophelia's place, and they had they laid out a meal for us, and uh, they showed us to a room, and then we had a shower and went to bed. It was just it's just amazing to come to a place of refuge like that. So thank you, Tim, and thank you for that word this morning. Communion, I don't ever take it lightly. It's an opportunity for us as a community to show one of the distinct things that mark us. It's a distinct thing that marks us. We have chosen to remember who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. And we make memory of that. And he says, whenever you do that, do it in memory of me. Whenever we take communion together, we're remembering his presence, we're remembering his power, we're remembering his sacrifice, and we're also remembering he's our soon coming king, amen? It's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, listen, I better get started. <laughs> I better get started. The third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. There is so much packed in this. It's, it's just, again, it's, the word of God is such that it just, when God says, my word will go out and it will not return to me void, the word of God is so capable of going out and expanding and filling into the dark places and the low places and bringing light into the substance of that. You have to understand there is a place that is maybe in your own soul that's formless and void and it's just waiting for something to come in and give it shape. Something to come in, an energy, a force that will come in with a power that will now begin to reshape that void place, to reshape that empty spot, to reshape that thing that is like a question, what am I going to be? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? 
It's going to reshape that into something that the creator says, now that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I like that. That's so good, I think I'm just going to rest. You see, God's word is just not like any other word. It's endless. It's regenerative. It's healing if you need healing. It's hope if you need hope. It's joy if you need joy. If there's an absence of joy, his word will bring that which you need. His word lacks nothing, but it adds everything. So, do you want to draw on his word? Because he said, I am the word. <laughs> you see, you're not just reading words on a page. You're actually receiving an entity, a power, a force. What happens when love walks in the room? Walks in the room. It's more than just something that you can forget. Love can sit in this chair and the presence is there and it's undeniable. So the name of the Lord. Well, if you read scripture, and I'm not going to go into this today. I think it would take me off on a whole other track. The Lord has many names. Jehovah, you've heard of some of them. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah El Shalom. The Lord has many names that all refer to his greatness, his nature of who he is. And then somehow, and in some way, he took all of that and he rolled it into one and he said, I'm going to give this name to my son. And it will be the name above all names. It'll be the culmination of all the words that you use, all the names that you use to describe me. They will be in the name of Jesus. That's that one name you need. I'm sure some of you have heard some of the stories. I was driving. Suddenly my car was out of control. I was hurtling towards the cliff. There's no doubt in my mind I was headed for death. I had nothing I could do. Nothing I thought I could say except for Jesus. And suddenly, unexplainably, my car stopped on the precipice of the cliff as though a hand invisible, a force, just stopped the entire car. That was a testimony of a friend of mine. She was driving through the Malibu Canyons. She said her car just lit out. She thought, I'm dead. That's all she could say. Jesus. That was it. That's all she needed to say. The name above all names. So, in studying the commandments, it's interesting because we, we say rules. There's a movie I used to like. It was like a pirates movie. I, I can't even, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, I think I liked it because I went to the ride at Disneyland first. But in that movie, <laughs> it's kind of funny because they talk about the pirate code. And they say, well, it's really more like guidelines. You know, the Ten Commandments, they're not guidelines. But if you try to follow them as a rule of law for your life, you're already lost. You see, the idea of the Ten Commandments was that God was going to come to a people and then he was going to introduce himself to that people. And that by introduction and by way of course, he would change their lives. Let's get a little context. The Israelites, people who were really 
nothing special. We're living as slaves in a land with a group of people who thought they were really special. They thought they were the ones that were the anointed ones. They were the chosen ones. They were the special ones. They had all the gold. They had all the glory, I guess you could say, although it be manufactured, to prove that. And so they started making monuments to themselves and to the things that would come up in their imaginations. And they would begin to form pictures in people's minds of what gods would look like, what they could do in their imagination. But all of those were fake. They were just figments of someone's imagination. So when God came to the people of Israel and said, I'm going to be your God, he had to get rid of that whole culture, that whole idea that God could be this thing that you could just put on a table and worship. God could be this thing that depending on what it looked like outside, he was either for you or against you. Oh, it's looking kind of cloudy. I guess he's mad. He had to get rid of all that because that's what they were locked in. They were locked into a culture. They were locked into ideas. They were locked into imaginations, most of which wasn't even theirs. They were just kind of being someone that they could get along with. You know what I mean? Just my life goes better when I just kind of do what they do. God was like, uh-uh. He said, I'm going to be different. Matter of fact, I'm going to be so different, I don't want you to even bring those other things before me. Let's start off by just talking about the first two commandments. In studying the first commandment, no doubt, it was indicated that the commandment was about the proper object of your worship. That only one true God is to be worshipped. In saying that, God does not mean that he wants us to be thinking of him as first amongst a bunch of other gods. No, he said, I want you, you want you to understand this. I'm the only one. He means he wants no other God to be before his face. He's the only true God. He's not saying that there are other gods. <laughs> He's saying that there are no other things that people make into gods that should be considered God. Because there's a lot of things that people worship or people kind of make into God. They want it to be God for them at that moment. Whatever that thing may be. I don't even have to use my imagination or you don't even have to use yours to figure out what some of those things are. But people make things into or make things out to be God. God says, no, I'm having none of that. No. He said, don't bring them before my face because I'm the only true God. I'm the only God who you ought to worship. The second commandment we saw a couple of weeks ago or however it was last week with Veronica. It says, this is how to worship God. The way you worship God. How is, in the second commandment, God explicitly says that he did not want to be worshipped via idols. There's kind of a famous story where the Israelites kind of melted all their jewelry down and they made this golden calf. And of course, when you see it on TV, it's gigantic. But it was actually probably no bigger than this water bottle. Maybe even a little smaller than that. When they took all their jewelry and melted it all together, that's what they ended up with. Now, they did not think that was their God. But they thought that they could bring this as a representation of the God that they were now going to serve. God said, get that out of here. It had nothing to do with me. Nothing. There's nothing that is even close 
to my nature that is represented by that thing. So that was the second commandment. God said, uh uh-uh, don't bring any idols. He commands the Israelites for worshiping him. He says, don't do this through any other vehicle, not through a golden calf, not through anything. We worship the one true God, not according to the imaginations of our mind or the preferences of our wills. We worship him the way that he teaches us to worship him through the Bible. You know, people ask me over the course of years, I've, I've just, partly because of my vocation, I have to talk to people about their life. And a lot of times they're asking me for things on wisdom, basically. They're saying, I'm coming to seek out your wisdom, Pastor Wayne. I say, you don't have to call me Pastor Wayne. They just, just call me Wayne. <laughs> Some called me cool brother in the past. I think that's going to go to you now, that title. Say, I need your wisdom. I said, well, you don't need my wisdom. All my wisdom could fit in the head of a thimble. But let's see if we can tap into the wisdom of God for your situation. Because his wisdom is endless. I said, you know, there's two ways to really get wisdom. Over time, you'll accumulate wisdom. You talk to somebody who's a little older than you. Maybe they've got a little gray hair on their head or on their chin. I got rid of mine today. But if you talk to them, they'll probably have some wisdom because time has given them that. You read this word of God, it's full of wisdom. It's full of wisdom. It is men and women who have gone before you And all of their time span on this earth is accumulated and put into the context of a story that will impart wisdom to you. You want to take note of that. The Bible is a book of wisdom. It's not a book of wisdom. God is wisdom. God is wisdom. He doesn't just give you wisdom. He is wisdom. If you have him, you have wisdom. You will have discernment. You will know the right thing to do, the right way to go, the right time to go there. That's what comes with his wisdom. That's what comes with him. So you want to take part in that. Let's read that third commandment because we've just reviewed the first two. We're getting into the actual text now. (laughs) You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Amplified Version, I love it, it says, that is irreverently in false affirmations or in ways to impugn the character of God. For the Lord will not hold guiltless nor leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain, disregarding its reverence and its power. You know, we sing songs, we sung one in worship today about the power in the name. It's really interesting. I mean, I heard this years and years ago, and I think, you know, I'm sure you've heard this. It bears repeating for those who may not have heard it. But have you noticed that nobody uses the name of Buddha to curse? It just doesn't have the power. It doesn't have the power. Why do people use the name of Jesus Christ as a curse? I mean, Matt, I have never heard anybody curse using your name. Too handsome, I'm sure. Yeah, that that, goes without saying. But why would you have to emphasize your situation, good or bad, by using the Lord's name? I don't generally walk around saying, this is one Benjamin of a day. There's nothing wrong with Benjamin's name. It just doesn't elicit that expression of power. I don't look at something or have something happen that just causes me to go, Wayne! 
even though some say it's Wayne's World, it did, doesn't work. It just falls flat. But the name of Jesus, the name of God the Father, this is the name and the power that he says. He says it in this commandment like it's something actually legal. It's like a legal term. He said it's a term that when you invoke this name, there is something behind it. There's a gravitas. There's a weight. There's an acknowledgement that there's a power that is able to actually determine whether that name is being used in a righteous manner or an unrighteous manner. That's heavy. Does anybody know why we still have a jury system? I mean, you, if you know, just, you, you know, if you're legally or otherwise, just shout it out. To, to give authority over sub subjectivity. That's, that's good. That's good. I'm not sure I know what it means, but it's good. <laughs> so, in addition to that, <laughs> they have individuals who are going to serve in the sense of a jury to stand up, put their hand on the Bible, raise their right hand, and swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, Matt. So help me, Benjamin. So help me, Wayne. No. So help me, God. Why would you use his name in that instance? Well, let me just substitute a name. If I use Benjamin's name in that instance, then it would be up to Benjamin to determine whether or not I was telling the truth. It would be up to him to determine whether or not my assertions were real or they were false. But see, when we use and we invoke the name of God, even though we can't touch him, we can't feel him, we cannot see him. We are invoking the thing that we believe in the society is the strongest thing we can invoke, our conscience. Our conscience is going to be our guide. I swear by God, and my conscience, because none of you can tell me whether I'm telling the truth or not, but my conscience knows. And my conscience, as long as I'm living and breathing, is subject to God's authority above all else. I can't get you to change your conscience. But God can move you in such a way where you can actually reveal your thoughts to someone. And you will know whether it's right or wrong based on whether or not you stand before him. You see, he cannot be manipulated. He is God. He is truth. Not he just believes in truth. He is truth. He's truth. You know, what does that mean? Well, that means that certain things that we perceive to be true will be fully exposed when he walks in. It's dark in here. Somebody find the switch that says turn on the darkness. Can't. But when he walks in the room, there's light. It says the darkness flees before him. Because he's the truth. 
The darkness is what exists in the absence of his truth. A lie is simply the absence of truth. Because when truth comes, the lie is dispelled. A myth exists without the truth. Because when the truth comes, it's no longer a myth. It's fact. So God's wanting you to know in the third commandment, my name is such a name that when you invoke my name, it is a legal and binding thing. It is a presence and a power that supersedes everything else in the room, in the atmosphere, anything you can think of or imagine. This is above that. And when I come in and I come on the scene, everything defers to it. So why would you just do that cavalierly? See, he's not just talking about speaking his name. He's talking about if you call yourself a Christian, you are representative of his name. He has actually put his name on you. He says, I am in you. You represent me. And therefore, if you are carrying me in you and you speak, you are speaking by my name. In a sense, he's giving you the power of eternity. I said the power of eternity, not the power of attorney. That's what rests upon you. It's greater than an attorney. This is a name that for all time, past, past, present, past, future. That's, that's, that's hard to get your head wrapped around. He was there in the beginning and he's there in the end. How did he work that out? He saw you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He saw you. He saw you. He didn't say in generalities. He didn't say, I just saw the community. He saw you. He saw your wife. He saw your child. He saw us as individuals. Before we were created. Before the foundation of the world. Wait a minute. That's a long time ago. But what he did in bringing the third commandment to his people. Is he was further helping them to understand that he was setting them apart. There was a uniqueness to them. You see, they just didn't see themselves as that. I would say that the Israelites kind of saw themselves as just working class. How do you see yourself? I don't know. Maybe we have some kings and queens in here. I don't know. I don't know. But pretty much for the lot of the Israelites... They saw themselves as working class folks. They go to work every day. They earn a right to go to work the next day. There's a lot of people who kind of see themselves in that light today as working class. Until God shows up. Until God shows up. And he says, well, I don't know what they say, but this is what I say. You're mine. You belong to me. Matter of fact, I'm going to teach you a few things. I'm going to lead you a certain way. I'm going to be with you in a certain way. I'm going to show you some things 
They don't have any understanding for it. There's no grid for it. They've got hundreds of gods, small g, but I'm one God, the only God. I'm God the Holy Father. I'm God the Holy Son, and I'm God the Holy Spirit, and I'm one. Oh, so we've got something like that. You see, we got the God, he's the God of the sun. And we, we got the God of the moon, because you've got the sun, you've got to have the moon. And I say, no, 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 no. You're, you're already going down the wrong path. So God started with, in the first commandment, here's who I am. Then he said in the second commandment, here's how you worship me. Then he said in the third commandment, again, here's who I am. It's almost like he went back to one. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. Oh, and by the way, you shall not use my name in vain because you shall have no other gods before me. I'm the only one. It's that thing, you know? Take two steps forward, one step back. Because you're just going to land on who God is. He's like no other. His commandments come into your life not as rules. They come into your life in the person of God. And with that person comes the power to stand and say, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. And I've got my wife, and I got my kids, and I got my friends and neighbors, and I am still not going there. And it's the 4th of July. I could bring my own fireworks show right now. I'm not going there. What has gotten into Yancey? No. Who has gotten into Yancey? There's not a what in this world that can stop a man from being a man. When that man thing gets in him, or that woman thing gets in him. So you ask me, what does that mean? Oh boy. Take me off on another tangent. You know, if you go all the way back to the garden, Adam and Eve, or Adam, because the man and the woman were first called Adam, Eve got her name after the fall. They were one, they were naked, they were unashamed. Then there's the fall. Now, there's a great debate whose fault it was. I do know this. God gave the instructions to Adam. He... <laughs> so Eve got it secondhand. How does that work today? <clears throat> But then God had to come and he had to fix that right off the bat. He had to tell them things like, okay, who told you you were naked? That's a lie. Why? Because I'm the truth. You didn't come to me for that, so you had to come to somebody else. And if you didn't come to me, then you believe the lie. So let's deal with that. Who told you you were naked? And what are those things that you're wearing? Adam, is that your idea too? Well, here, let me cover you up. Why? Because you're not under my covering anymore, and I need you back under my covering. So the first clothing designer. And then, now he has to deal with the lie. Okay, you, Mr. Serpent, more crafty, in any other creature in this garden. You're upright. 
yeah, you're walking tall now, but no, from now on, you can just eat dirt. Adam, what made you think she did? Adam, what made you think that you should listen to him? Oh, I thought I made that clear. She did. <sighs> Back to the serpent. Okay, you're cursed. And now here's the remedy for that curse. I'm going to make her crush your head. Yeah, but what about Adam? I could, no, shut up. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She is going to crush your head. So what is this lie about the enemy being our enemy? You see, we're the devil's enemy. He's not ours. God said that she would crush him. That means he's afraid of us. By a woman's seed, which is the only reason why any of us are here. By the power God vested in her, we will vanquish the enemy. So the feminine in you, men, makes you say, I've got my wife and my kids here. I want to protect them but I don't want them to see my rage. You see, there's a war on the feminine in every one of us. You see, God created them, Adam, male and female, as one. Because it took two, the image of a man, the image of a woman, to actually show the nature of God. Don't think of it as separate. Think of it as one. Think of the masculine traits of God in a woman when she orders her household or she orders her job or she does her job and her house and all those things. Think of the feminine traits of God in a man when he actually blesses his family or prays for his family or does something out of love to nurture and care for his family. This war created by the enemy, oh, you're separate. Oh, you're him, and she's she, and they're there. All this, just stirring it up. Did God really say? Did God really say? You see, we get off into this, but God says, in this third commandment that we shouldn't have any other gods before him because he's the truth. He's where we land when we get into this territory of am I right, am I wrong, is it this, is it that, is it good, is it bad? This is our guide. This is getting a little heavy, isn't it? Because you came to church this morning and you just thought, we're going to hear a good message and we're going to skip out of here. Or we're gonna... <laughs> but we got to deal with this. Why? Because people today say that the Ten Commandments aren't relevant anymore. They're saying that if you just try to live by those commandments, you're just going to be out of step. You're going to be out of tune. But that's not true. You see, the Ten Commandments weren't about rules. The Ten Commandments were about the embodiment of the nature of God so that he could have a relationship with you. And you needed to know who he was. You can't have a relationship with a stranger. You can't have a relationship with someone 
if you marry that person and then you find out that that person isn't who you thought they were. Why? Because everything they told you was a lie. So who do you blame? Do you blame them? Adam did. <laughs> or should you blame yourself for not going to the source? Who discerns right from wrong? Who would never deceive you? You see, that's what this is about. This isn't about whether or not the commandment is right or wrong. This isn't even about if in your imagination you see it as right or wrong. If you see that this commandment works for you, that's good. That's right. If you see it doesn't work for you, oh, that's, that, I, I don't need that. I ain't having that. This isn't really about what you know. And it's really not about what you don't know. It's about who you will know or who you won't know. Will you know him for who he is? Will you say, I'm not going to use his name in vain. I'm not going to represent myself as a Christian. I'm not going to do what everybody else does and think I'm okay. That's why you're here today. Because regardless of what's going on out there today, and it's a big world. I just drove most of it, it feels like. <laughs> You're in here today. And the God of all time, the God of the universe, is saying, I want you to know who I am. Don't put anything else before me. Don't believe anything else but me. Trust me. Love me. Obey me. Not because you have to. Because you want to. And see me for who I am. I'm the God that will set you apart from the culture you're in from the working class to the upper class. I'm the God who has a purpose and plan for you. It doesn't matter what stage of your life you're in. He's the God that heals you. He says, I do that. Why? Because I formed you in your mother's womb. You were born into a world that, yeah, it's got disease and fallen, but that's not what I intended you for. You come into the knowledge of who I am and you will begin to see your real future. And by the way, you can claim it now. Let's just close in prayer. For, yeah, go ahead. Before you pray, thank you, Uncle Wayne. Come on, come on. <laughs> I just want to highlight something that you shared, and, and I'm going to ask you to pray over us. Because again, a part of this commandment is not the rule of trying to keep this. When you really look at what it's telling us, is any misappropriation of God's name, he says, is worthy to be punished. That's heavy. That's deep. And if you are honest with yourself and, and myself included. Anytime that you have misrepresented him, there's a punishment that's due. But thanks be to God that he didn't leave it there because Jesus took that punishment for us because he knew this was too hard, too high of a demand for any one of us to fulfill in and of ourselves. But what it tells us about God is that he wants whatever's representing him to actually be him. You see, he's not into hypocrisy. That's a beautiful thing. You see, he's not just impressed by how we sound or what it looks like on the outside. He's saying, my name is my name, and every time you use it, I want it to be used appropriately, referencing me. And if it's not, 
then it's worthy to be punished. But in this moment, we get an opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Because how many times have we misused his name? Maybe we don't use that swear word when we stub our toe. But maybe we laugh at jokes when it's actually used in movies that we're watching. Maybe there's moments where we're not representing what he's like. Unlike Yancey, who had this moment of realization, I don't want to misrepresent who God is in this moment, so I'm going to hold back the old me to allow the new me, the spirit in me, to be represented in this moment. You see, we need God. That's what these commandments are supposed to really point us to, is our need for him. Us to recognize and realize, God, without you, there's no way that I could totally, perfectly represent you. But by your spirit, if you put something on the inside of me, if you empower me with something that's greater than the forces within myself, then all of a sudden I have an opportunity to win in this life. I have an opportunity to walk this out, but not without you. You see, that's the dependency God was creating through these commandments. And so I'm going to ask Uncle Wayne to pray over us because if you're here like me, I'm going to raise both of my hands and say, God, I need you today because without you, I can't do this. So if that's you and you want God to meet you where you are, you want him to fill you with his presence, to enable you to represent him properly every time you're out and about, whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're picking up your children from school, whether you're at school, no matter where you are, see, we want to represent him well, don't we? But we need him. Can you pray for us? Thank you. You know, I used to have a friend, and I say used to, still a friend, but and he fell in love, and the first thing he did was he tattooed her name on his arm. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if that's biblical, but it's interesting. But then there I was in Revelation 19, and I was reading And it was talking about Jesus coming back, riding a horse. And it said that a name was tattooed on his thigh, written on his thigh, and written on his garment. I'm like, what's that name? Whose name did Jesus go to the tattoo artist in heaven and say come on write that right here on my thigh so while I'm riding that white horse I can see it and in case they miss it put it on my garment yeah put it on my robe so when it's flapping in the breeze they can still read that name he has the name above all names And on his thigh is written the name that we don't know what it says. But I'm going to take a shot. It says, my beloved. My beloved. That's you. That's me. He says, I'm coming. I'm coming. You see, we live in a period of grace right now. It's just what Benjamin said. Jesus Christ came, he suffered, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, according to the scriptures. And it says he will come again. And when he does, he's coming for his beloved, his bride. Ooh, there it is again, the feminine. Why is the church called his bride? Because she's going to crush the head of the serpent. She's going to be victorious. She's not getting it second hand. It's coming right from God. You're my beloved. Through you, I will vanquish the enemy. I want the women to stand right down to their feet. All the women in this congregation, please stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, I thank you that your commandments are true. They are yes, and you are our amen. 
that embodied in every feminine, Lord God, every masculine, is the spirit and the nature of the living God. Lord, the feminine is represented in our midst. The feminine will prevail against the enemy. And today we thank you that by your word we have the opportunity, Lord God, to say we are marked by you. We are whole in you. Lord, I pray for this community. As the women in this community arise and take their place, Lord God, their place of significance, men, would you stand to your feet? As the men of this community stand with and alongside, Lord God, the war on the feminine will not prevail in this place. Lord God, you've given us male and female. You've given us men who have, Lord God, the strength of the feminine in them. You've given us men that, Lord God, seek to be the covering, the boldness, the strength. We have women, Lord God, who, Lord God, you've imparted the masculine in, in this community. You have women, Lord God, who bring us into right order, who help to lead us, who help to speak to us, to make us strong, Lord God, as a unified body of believers. So, Lord God, today, let us take our place together. Let us take what the enemy has tried to tear apart, tried to separate, tried to define, tried to somehow mark us or lie to us or deceive us into believing it's somehow about being masculine or being feminine or being bold or somehow making a declaration that's anything but declaring that you are one God above all of us in all of us and through all of us and to all of us we give you glory we give you honor and we thank you in the name of your son Jesus Christ.